Hi, my name is Julie. I'm an engineer at Microsoft. And in this video, I'm going to share with you my CI CD DevOps review that I conduct with Azure customers. Um, so this is not a checklist. It's really a discussion about DevOps in real life, what you're currently doing. And we'll look at it compared to best practices. Um, you will get insights into what an experienced DevOps engineer and architect looks for. And because it's real life, it's all about the thought process, right? Not the answers, much like an interview. So the contents of this review and video are based on my experiences, both as an engineer and enterprise architect at Allianz Germany, uh, when we started going to the cloud in 2016. Um, so as an enterprise architect, I mentor dozens of teams, about a few hundred developers um, in our agile training centers in Munich and Stuttgart. Um, and if you're interested, I also have a talk that I gave at Enter.js in 2018 called Full Stack Do-It-Yourself JavaScript CI-CD. Okay, so I usually start with release management because it's more concrete than some of the sort of CI-CD workflow um, discussions. And um, the first thing I ask is sort of, how do you do versioning? Uh, when you're releasing something to a user, an end user, or a developer who consumes an API, for example, you need to be able to tell them what changed. Um, Sometimes customers start with um, just an integer in the pipeline, so kind of like this, what you see here. Um, and it's integer, doesn't really mean much. Uh, what I usually recommend is that people check out semantic versioning, which is pretty common. And so it follows the major dot minor dot patch. Even if you're not releasing software uh, for other developers, it's still good to version so that you know what is it you're giving your users. Chances are your stakeholders are going to be asking you as well. So. If we continue further, we can uh, answer that question of the stakeholders actually by showing them a change log. And with discipline, there's a really nifty way to automatically generate that change log. And so I recommend uh, you look at conventional commits. And so if you look at here, it describes the pattern and it has a body, it has some footer. The most important thing is actually just sort of this bit, right? It has something with a colon, so fix or feature. Uh, or feet. Um, and what it does is it categorizes the commits. And so let me just open already an example change log from one of my sample projects. And you'll see here the heading features. And under features, you see in bold Azure pipelines and security. And that's because the commit for them uh, actually uses the convention. So let's open up this one. It says feet, Azure pipelines, and then it has, yeah, some text. Um, What's really nice is that not only do you quickly see kind of what changed, it's also linked to the commit that made that change. Um, and to make all that happen is um, I use standard version, which is an NPM package. Um, and I use this as well in non Node.js projects um, because I can install it globally on my machine and generate the change log. Git strategies, that's always fun. Um, I've given up explaining how they work to customers in part because I use Git on the command line. Like I understand how it works on a very low level. And so I'm really the wrong person to explain it to you. And ultimately it is so complicated and it is so tied to your workflow. The best way to learn it is actually just to try it. So nowadays what I do is I point out that um, Git flow started it all. And even in this original article, uh, it says, Hey, this was written in 2010. It's a long time now since then, maybe you want to go look at somewhere else. Um, the next thing that comes up in the historical timeline is the GitHub flow. Um, and so that's this page here. It's a nice introduction in terms of how to branch off from your long living branch with a pull request, have some discussion and merge it back in. And that's where I usually tell people to start, right? Just, do this where you put your changes onto the side so that you still have one stable long lived branch and definitely get into the practice of using pull requests and having discussions, right? You really want to look at what code is going into your code base, which is basically saying which code is going to be deployed. Um, once you've sort of gotten that down, what you can do is uh, explore further. And actually I wanted to open this window for GitLab flow. So GitLab flow adds a bit more sort of steps on top of that. You have multiple long lived branches, uh, which you probably will have at some point because you're going to have more than one cloud environment, right? You'll have a staging environment. You'll definitely have a production environment and maybe you'll have stuff in between as well. And that's where it gets sort of tricky. Um, so 
that's one thing where I'll talk to customers about if they've already tried it out. Um, and then we'll just have a discussion and I'll poke at sort of, are you sure it's really deploying there? How do you get something from here to there? Um, but I don't go too much in detail. And what I wanted to show in this page is, um, this is one flow, uh, which was created by a guy from AWS, Adam Ruka, if I pronounce his name correctly. Um, and, uh, it's also very interesting and he has some nice sort of diagrams. And what I tell customers to do is if you really want to know, if you understand what you're doing, draw these diagrams. So there's two topics that I usually like to discuss together, and um, they are databases and scheduled pipeline runs. So databases, uh, people often forget, kind of like, oh, I'm just deploying my code and all is good. Well, what about the database, right? Um, if you're adding new features, chances are you're gonna change the database schema. So how are you gonna do that? Are you going to do a backup before you deploy? Okay, well, how long does that take for a really large database? Do you have time to do that? Um, what are you going to do if it fails, if the database migration fails, right? Do you have to roll back the code and the database? And how are you going to do that? And um, I usually bring up then at this point as well, schedule pipeline runs. So a big easy is always to, you know, schedule pipeline run to back up your database every night. Yes, there are tools as well that, you know, either your cloud provider, et cetera, will give you and they could do backups for you. Um, I personally like doing them in my pipelines because then I have just sort of one view where I can see it. And the other reason why I do that is that um, what I like to do for projects that I run in production, um, so side projects from my failed entrepreneur days or when I was a freelancer, um, anyway, uh, to be confident that my production deployment will work, um, I need a staging environment that is as close as possible to production, including the data set, right? So I like having a pipeline that runs nightly and actually just copies over the production database to a, a pre-production environment. And there will also be a script as well to actually go through all that data um, before it saves it. Um, and go through and wipe out any sort of personally identifiable information, so PII for privacy reasons, etc. cetera, um, and that runs nightly. And so, yeah, I don't know, I just prefer to have that in my pipeline, and I don't even know if a cloud provider will do that for you. Um, definitely not cleaning all the data, so I do that. Okay, so I just talked about the database. Um, let's just talk about deployment itself and the rollout strategy. Um, so people love fancy terms like, you know, canary and blue-green deployments and rolling updates, etc. cetera. Um, if you are using those terms, I'll just say, okay, walk me through, what are you doing? Why, how? Um, and the most important questions I ask you is that, how do you know it actually works, All right? So the complicated bit is, I will bring up again the issue with the database. Um, do things have to happen in a certain order, right? And then if you try to kind of talk your way out of it, I will always just say, are you sure? Are you sure? So now you've convinced me that you know your deployment has succeeded and that your users are happy. So let's talk through the opposite scenario. Let's say you introduce a bug. It doesn't matter if somebody you know, filed it or you found it after the fact. How are you going to do a rollback? Um, many people think about, oh, I'm just going to you know, roll back the other code state. Okay, what about the database? All right. Did you do some sort of migration and you also have to revert the migration? Or what happens if, oh, the code, you know, it deployed fine. And after that, I'm going to try the migration and the mig migration fails part way. All right. How do you deal with sort of broken data? Like, what are you going to do? Um, I don't have any real answer for you, right? It depends on your product. Um, but it's a good conversation to have. Um, and it reveals how prepared you are. And um, it sucks to not have an answer, but it's better to not have an answer in a discussion or an interview than to actually be in the situation where you're in production and the clock is ticking and costing you money. So in this review, I'll also talk about configuration and credentials. Um, the best example usually being databases. You'll probably have different ones for production and non-production, et cetera, and each one will have different credentials. And how are you juggling all of those, right? So your pipeline is running. How does it know which credentials to feed to use? Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe the application has already been pre-configured with the credentials and it doesn't need it. But wait a minute, who's running the database migration job? Because if it's the build server, it actually needs the credentials. Um, so in this part, it's a little bit of conversation, but usually it's more of a review and we'll go and look in 
to the setup in Azure DevOps or Jenkins, if we had more Jenkins customers, um, we'll go look at it and see just sort of how it's done. Bit of a sanity check. Okay, governance. One of my favorite topics, not just because I used to be an enterprise architect, but also because I'm that cheeky jerk who's going to try to find a loophole or a backdoor somewhere and um, yeah, poke you, tickle you. Um, anyway, so in this part of the conversation, um, I'll usually ask for your governance model on the Azure ARM side. So fast track customers usually already have this. Um, and then we'll look at it from the DevOps side. Have you applied the same permissions? So for example, uh, many organizations will say contractors for legal reasons, uh, or rather their legal department says, you know, they can't access production. Okay, well, let's look at your DevOps settings and make sure that a contractor indeed cannot deploy to production without going through some steps. So we'll look at the everything from the pipelines itself, the configurations, all the way down to the repositories, right? Because even if you say like, oh, the contractor doesn't have access to the Azure portal, whatever, and they can't like actually manually run a pipeline, uh, if I can make a commit, I can deploy, end of story. So we'll go through that configuration to make sure it really is set up the way you expect it. And if you have such a requirement, we can you know look through it and make sure, okay, it really is set up that way. Um, the other thing, again, that we'll do is just look in general um, at the roles that you have. I mean, at least sort of like the um, admins or people who have elevated privileges and then the defaults, the developers, and just, yeah, make sure they're kind of mapped properly, both on the cloud side as well as the CICD side. Okay, so the review would not be complete unless we actually looked at a pipeline. Um, so a YAML pipeline in the case of Azure DevOps or um, GitHub Actions, a Jenkins file, uh, if it's Jenkins. And um, I will just ask you to walk me through it, talk me through it. Uh, there is no right or wrong answer per se in terms of stages versus steps, etc. The most important thing is that you understand what it does. It works the way you expect it to behave and that it's cost efficient, right? In terms of parallel running some jobs in parallel, etc. cetera. Um, one tip that I sometimes give customers is that it doesn't have to be all one file. You can have multiple files per environment. I separate out uh, scheduled jobs into their own files. Um, sometimes pull requests is their own YAML file. And yes, it's many files, uh, but more important than the number of files and the lines of code is how quickly can I find what I'm looking for? How quickly can I understand what's actually running and when, like what are the triggers? Um, so yeah, that's, you know, a conversation. Um, if you're thinking of upskilling, go through various different uh, use cases. Um, and look at different sort of pipelines or just find sample pipelines um, in public GitHub repositories and talk through them. If you can talk through them, like you really understand what's going on, then that's awesome. So sometimes people ask me, how can I make this better? Like I have a few files. Can I reduce the number of files? Can I make it less code? Uh, less code isn't always better. Um, and if you want to use uh, shared template libraries, it requires a bit of planning. Um, if it's just you, then it's less planning. Um, things like semantic versioning still apply. Um, but if you want to do it across an organization, that requires a lot of planning, which um, my colleagues and I at the Allianz learned the hard way. So um, as part of a central team that was you know, guiding the developers in our DevOps journey, we thought, okay, some of the problems we solved in a nice way um, in Groovy code for Jenkins Pipeline, Let's make a pipeline library and share it with all the developers, right? They will love us and thank us for making their lives so much easier. Um, but what we forget is that nothing is perfect from day one and you can always improve upon things. So one of the first problems that we had was all these people like with yeah, feature requests, or this doesn't quite work the way I want it. Can you rename it this way? Whatever. Um, and of course we also had bugs because nobody's perfect. And we try to create kind of a, you know, open source within the organization. So inner source community where, you know, we thought, oh, everybody can fix this. Everybody can see the source code, right? So just make a pull request, we'll improve it and everybody will be able to benefit. Um, actually, what we ended up having, having was dozens of forks and people just basically ran their own fork. And then if in our central repository, we finally fix something or we introduce something that was new, they would just copy and paste into their own fork. And so <laughs> we didn't really have the open source that we wanted to. 
uh, have. And in retrospect, I think um, we should have considered more kind of like, okay, what is our process? What is the rules for contributing? Um, you know, define a standard for ourselves as well, you know, including documentation, etc. What's a breaking change? Um, and make the expectations sort of more clear to the teams. Um, and as frustrating as it is that people just kind of ended up copying and pasting and doing their own thing, um, whatever, it works. The most important thing is that they're shipping, right? So my ego aside, it was a success. So no CICD review is complete without talking about environments, without talking about how we get code uh, for features, uh, for example, all the way from a developer's laptop into you know your main branch, um, deployed into a staging environment and any sort of uh, in-between um, environments like UAT, et cetera, before going into production. Um, this part of the review, I ask the customer to explain to me kind of what they're doing, what they chose to do and why. Um, sometimes it's expected that I tell them what to do. And the thing is, I can't do that. So if you're using .NET, for example, or Java, I have no clue how that works. Um, I only know, you know, Node.js and Ruby and those particular workflows. What's more important is really just conceptually, I've made a feature. What do I need to do? Do you have unit tests? Do you have integration tests? Do you have end-to-end -end tests? Um, how does that really look like uh, for you across all stages? And usually you don't have everything. You don't have integration tests and end-to-end -end tests and unit tests, unless maybe you're like Netflix or something. Um, or at least you won't have it in the very beginning and it's okay, right? That's why you're here talking to me. If you have all these answers, I don't know why you're talking to me. Um, if you have, for the purpose of this YouTube channel, if you have a particular use case um, that you want me to sort of go through in a video, let me know uh, in the comments below, subscribe, and maybe I'll make that for you. Um, I say maybe because it is a lot of work. Um, we did that to a certain extent um, when I was an engineer at um, Allianz Germany before I became an enterprise architect and it's complicated and it's so use case specific, um, but I could do it if you asked me to or if enough people asked me to. So let me know and maybe I'll make that video for you. So if you watched all the way to the end, um, you can see now that I have this on my finger uh, because I have uh, RSI again. So repetitive uh, strain injury from coding. Um, and that's why it's taken then as well two weeks for me to release this video or actually two weeks since the last release to actually record this video. If I can do it very quickly and semi sloppily, I'll maybe just throw that on there uh, on YouTube. And, um, yeah, so I don't know. I'm trying to rest the, rest the finger. I have a couple of, uh, videos that I started recording. Um, there's some work stuff as well coming up. Um, the end to end R back. Uh, stuff which is actually really interesting. I love it as a former enterprise architect and it's cloud agnostic. Um, and so I'll record it in a cloud agnostic way as well and publish that. But um, yeah, other than that, uh, sorry for the delay, but I can't help it if my hand hurts, there's not much more I can do. And uh, it's March, so slowly it'll be Easter. Hopefully we can go out soon, um, travel, climb some more and uh, yeah. I'm just tired and rambling. Anyhow, see you soon.